The ancient bond between fire and gold has shaped legends, empires, and dreams of wealth that shimmer across history. Long before chemical acids or industrial machines existed, people looked at the raw, stubborn rock and believed that only one force in nature was powerful enough to break it open and reveal the treasure inside. That force was fire. The very same flame that warms a camp and cooks a meal also hides within it the key to unlocking veins of gold sealed away by stone for millions of years. And when a determined hand dares to use it, the rock transforms. It cracks, it surrenders, and sometimes it bleeds gold. Imagine standing in front of a rough, unyielding rock pulled straight from the earth. Its surface shows nothing more than dull gray, speckled quartz, or iron-stained crust. But deep inside, invisible to the naked eye, a thread of gold lies trapped. Your only tool is fire. No acids. No modern chemicals. Just flame, stone, and your own persistence. The story of separating gold from rock with fire is not only about skill, but about patience, danger, and respect for one of nature's most resistant secrets. The first step is not fire itself, but preparation. Before flame touches stone, the rock must be chosen with care. Not every rock will yield gold, and not every glittering sparkle inside quartz is what it appears to be. The human eye must learn to distinguish between fool's gold and the real thing. Pyrite glitters with sharp, brassy cubes, while true gold rests in smooth veins or rounded specks that catch light softly, almost like warm sunlight, frozen in stone. Holding the right rock is the beginning of the journey, because fire will not make gold appear where none exists. It only frees what is already trapped. Once the stone is chosen, the second act begins. Breaking it down. Fire alone cannot melt an entire unbroken rock. The mass must be reduced, weakened, and prepared for the dance with flame. Hammers strike, stones are cracked against each other, or if the hands are empty, one rock is hurled against another until it splits. The quartz resists but fractures under pressure, shards flying like sharp glass. Each piece broken down makes the fire's work easier, because fire is most powerful when it can reach the very heart of the stone. The fragments are gathered into a pile, their jagged edges glinting in faint light. This is where the fire must be prepared with intention. The flame that will release gold is no ordinary cooking fire. It must be fierce, concentrated, and long-lasting. Ancient gold seekers built beds of charcoal because charcoal burns hotter and steadier than wood alone. A shallow pit or stone enclosure is lined, then filled with black chunks of carbon that wait like silent soldiers for ignition. With sparks, the fire begins, growing, feeding, stretching toward its purpose. Soon the roar of flame swallows the night, and the first stage of the separation is set. Heat begins to creep into the stones, but gold is stubborn. It will not melt until it feels the extreme breath of fire. The quartz veins that hold it, however, are brittle under the right heat. As temperature climbs, quartz expands and cracks, unable to withstand the pressure. Each pop and split in the rock is a signal that the prison is weakening. The flames do not rush the process. They must be patient, licking slowly, allowing heat to soak deep until the stone itself cannot endure. This moment is the first miracle. Stone, once immovable, now betrays its weakness. Fire, invisible fingers of heat, prize open its grip, and flecks of gold begin to show. But the fire alone cannot always finish the task. The gold must be encouraged to separate, coaxed out with strategy. As the stones glow red, they are taken from the fire, their brittle shells ready to break further. Striking them now is easier than before, for heat has made them fragile. A hard blow shatters the quartz into powder and shards. The gold does not shatter. It resists, heavy and unyielding, falling away from the ash and dust. Already in this stage, the rock has been forced to give up its secret, but the process continues deeper because fire is not just a breaker of stone. It is a refiner. With every cycle of burning, heating, breaking, and collecting, the pile of golden fragments grows. It is slow. It is laborious, but it is real. The reward is pure, untouched by acid or machine, as natural as the earth itself. But the journey is only halfway. Fire can reveal gold, yes, but separating it fully and shaping it into something enduring 
requires more than just this stage. What comes next pushes the boundary further, testing patience, testing endurance, and demanding even greater respect for the marriage between flame and stone. Yet as precious as they seem, these raw fragments are not the end of the journey. The true treasure lies not just in glimpses of scattered gold, but in uniting those fragments, refining them, and holding in your hands a single, unmistakable piece that whispers of permanence. Fire has cracked the prison, but now it must serve as the final purifier. It is in this crucible of flame that the transformation begins. The gold surrenders not to destruction, but to release, softening into tiny molten beads that roll away from stone, collecting at the base of the fire pit. This moment is one of awe. Watching a bead of gold form is like seeing sunlight condensed into liquid form. It rolls lazily, its surface glowing not like fire, but like something eternal. It does not flicker, it does not vanish. It endures. Ancient seekers lacking chemicals understood this moment as a sign of purity itself. Gold, unlike other metals, does not burn. It does not tarnish. In the heart of fire, it only becomes more itself. The seeker must be careful here. Too much ash, too many impurities, and the molten gold risks being swallowed again. To prevent this, the bed of fire must be prepared with small, clean hollows, places where gravity can draw the gold to safety. Sometimes shallow depressions in stone are lined with clay and set near the fire's base, ready to catch the droplets. Other times, smooth leaves or shells are placed carefully, knowing they will burn away, but leave behind golden traces. The method matters less than the principle, giving the gold a place to gather, away from the chaos of melting rock. When the fire roars high and the quartz collapses into brittle fragments, the gold obeys its own law. Droplets find each other, joining, clinging together until what was once scattered dust becomes heavier, more noticeable, a single piece taking shape. The thrill of this moment is unmatched. No acid, no factory, just nature itself revealing its secret under the oldest force humankind has ever mastered. To see gold come alive in the flames is to witness the earth surrendering a treasure older than time. But the process does not end when the first beads appear. Fire must be repeated again and again, because gold often clings stubbornly to rock. Each cycle, heating, breaking, melting, and gathering, frees more until all that remains is a bed of ash and a handful of shining fragments. With patience, the seeker collects them, each one heavier than it looks, each one refusing to blend with dust or stone. And yet, the pieces are still scattered, fragile in their separation. What comes next is the final refinement. Now begins the stage of smelting, without chemicals, without acids, but with fire as the only companion. Smelting is not simply melting, it is the art of separation. To do this naturally, the seeker prepares flux. In ancient times, this was not a word from science, but a discovery of instinct. They noticed that when certain earths, like crushed limestone, borax-like salts, or even desert sands, were sprinkled into the fire with the stone, impurities clung to them. Quartz, iron, and other debris melted and mixed with the flux, while gold, heavier and resistant, separated cleanly. Without naming chemistry, they had discovered it. So the seeker gathers simple, natural flux. Perhaps it is ground limestone from a nearby cliff. Perhaps it is sand with a high silica content. Perhaps it is the ash of plants rich in salts. All are cast into the fire alongside the broken rock. As the temperature rises, impurities fuse with the flux, forming a glass-like slag. Gold refuses them, slipping away, heavy and unyielding, until it pools below the slag in glowing droplets of purity. And when the bead of gold is removed from the heart of fire, it cools in an instant, shrinking into a solid nugget. Small at first, no larger than a seed, but unmistakably gold. One nugget becomes two, two become three, and soon a collection begins to grow. Each piece is a story of flame and persistence, each one proof that no chemicals are needed, no harsh acids, only fire and patience. And as the seeker places them side by side, they begin to notice something extraordinary. The color is uniform. The weight is unmistakable. The texture is unlike any other metal. This is pure gold, ancient, eternal, 
freed from its stone prison by nothing more than flame. The journey is over, but its lesson remains. Gold does not yield easily. It demands patience, endurance, and respect for nature's oldest forces. To separate it from rock with only fire is to walk in the footsteps of those who first discovered its beauty thousands of years ago. And as you hold that final nugget in your hand, heavy and warm, you know one thing with certainty. This is not just gold. It is time itself, forged in the depths of the earth, carried through fire, and finally, after countless trials, yours to keep. And so the flames fade, leaving behind silence, ash, and one eternal truth. This is not just the story of extraction. It is the story of patience, resilience, and trust in nature's oldest forces. And remember, every rock you pass might be hiding a treasure, waiting for its moment in the fire. Stay curious, stay relentless, and stay with us. Because the Earth still has more mysteries to uncover.